All right, so the plan is we're going to start off visceral artery disease, then there'll be thoracic outlet, and then to make sure there are no survivors, we're going to bludgeon you to death with dialysis access at the end. So buckle up. All right, so they want me to talk about uh, anatomic and physiologic features of uh, visceral artery disease. So we'll talk about this vis-a-vis uh, -vis exposures or how you would get to these vessels. So the left flank approach is what we commonly use to get to the origins of the visceral vessels. It's good for the celiac and the proximal branches of the celiac. Uh, the splenic artery can be accessed through the left flank via the uh, posterior aspect of the pancreas. You can get to the SMA here proximally. There are no branches in the proximal SMA for about five centimeters, so it's a good spot to kind of mobilize if you're gonna do a bypass. Um, the middle colic, as you know, is the first major branch of the SMA. Uh, it's a common spot for emboli to occur. Um, and that comes off right around the pancreas. So the anterior lateral aspect of the SMA is where you expect to find the middle colic coming right out near the pancreas. Um, now, the one thing you have to be careful of in this area is uh, if for some reason you're doing this urgently, you don't have proper imaging, there can be a replaced right hepatic or even common hepatic. And the most common uh, aberrant locations for them to be coming off is the SMA. So if you don't have preoperative imaging, you do have to be careful in that area because the anatomy is not totally consistent. So where you're going to put your incision, we did some of these in the uh, lab on Thursday. I know a lot of you this is basic stuff, but uh, after the lab on Thursday, it's really not clear to me that you've had any medical training whatsoever, so we'll, <laughs> we'll assume you don't. Um, so if you want to get the full thoraco exposure, you have to go up high to the fourth or fifth rib uh, interspace, uh, to, and that'll get you all the way up to the left subclavian. If we're really just worried about the thoracic aorta and we want to get from the level of the diaphragm down, we can, we can lower that uh, quite a bit to 10th, 11th, 12th rib space and have nice exposure right down to the diaphragm. Uh, here's what uh, the textbook would have you believe it looks like. It's, it's hard to get to this spot, but you can get there uh, right through the diaphragm to the, uh, to the level of the celiac. And it, like I said, this is good exposure for the origins of these vessels. You won't get too far out without some difficulty, though. So if you're just trying to get to the origins, uh, I would take this uh, full thoraco approach. Uh, again, the, this is a, a good view. Here the kidney is up. So we, we're looking at the left renal artery there inferiorly, and then the SMA and the celiac. And again, you have good exposure to the origins here uh, with a little bit of work, but you're not going to be able to get too far out on any of them. All right, so if we're going to go to try to get further out on the vessels, we usually take a transperitoneal approach. Uh, once we've mobilized the bowel, however which way you want to do it, you have to make an incision in the parietal uh, peritoneum right over the origins of the vessels. And here's where we're going to divide the diaphragmatic cura. And it, these are fairly thick. And then once you get through that, you have to be careful because the inferior phrenic arteries are there. You've got to find them, ligate them so they don't uh, start bleeding. And then there's also usually a branch to the left adrenal gland coming right off the aorta there. So you've got to identify that, divide that so you don't kind of charge through. Um, now the median arcuate ligament needs to be divided. This is very vascularized, so we find that you really either want to tie off everything that you're dividing here, aggressive bovying. Uh, I have a partner who uses an argon beam for this, but this is very vascular. So you, as you're coming down uh, to the origin of the celiac, you have a big thick vascular uh, structure wrapped around the origin. So you, hemostasis is very important because bleeding in this area is uh, it's a pain in the ass, so be careful. Um, transperitoneal, the common hepatic artery you'll see from the celiac goes obviously towards the liver. Uh, this as well is encased in a lot of sympathetic nerve fibers which can be very vascular as well. But the first three to four centimeters of the uh, common hepatic usually branch free. So this is a good spot to do a bypass too. Uh, a lot of people do hepatorenal bypasses from this area. So the first three to four centi centimeters relatively free of branches, but they will be encased in a lot of uh, sympathetic nerve fiber, so you, it's not just a free shot to it. Uh, splenic artery, usually can palpate that right in the pancreas uh, along the superior border. Um, and again, the first four to five centimeters of splenic artery usually have no branches, so another good spot to do a bypass to or even from in some cases. 
left gastric artery is going to be coming up more right towards you, right? So that, that's heading right out towards you. It's the smallest of the three branches, and that goes towards the uh, lesser curvature of the stomach. So you have to be careful of left gastric when you're getting out those larger branches. Uh, if you do mobilize all the things I said, this is what you'll see. So this is a common exposure we do uh, in emergencies. So if we really need to get quick superciliac control, nowadays it's probably smarter to use a aortic occlusion balloon, but in the old days this is how we were taught to do it, to quickly get through lesser sac, uh, divide the diaphragmatic cura, and uh, cross clamp the aorta in a superciliac location. It's still a good uh, technique to have in your arsenal if you ever get into some, uh, you know, uh, aortic bleeding during any kind of elective case and you have to clamp it, you want to know uh, where to clamp and how to clamp. Um, so if you want to get out on the SMA, not to the origin, but out, and a lot of times we'll do this for, say, a retrograde thrombectomy. Um, so here we're going to go infracolic. So we mobilize and uh, the transverse colon. And then what you want to do is identify the third and fourth portions of the duodenum, and we're going to open the parietal perineum posteriorly, uh, just lateral to the third and fourth portion of the duodenum. Renal vein will be in your way. Uh, you can mobilize the renal vein quite a bit, actually. You have to take the branches. So one thing when you're mobilizing the renal vein, if you're, if you're going to take the branches of it, once you do that, you're committed to preserving the renal vein. If the renal vein is completely in your way, you can ligate it, um, but if you have to preserve the collateral branches. But to really, truly just mobilize it and preserve it, you uh, take the branches, and then you're going to retract the renal vein downward. SMA, usually you feel it before you see it. You're just going to reach on the aorta. It's usually coming right off anteriorly. It's a big vessel. It's uh, hard to miss, but it's not easily visualized at first. You want to know exactly where it is. Uh, once you know where it is, again, a big sympathetic nerve plexus, very vascularized. So you want to carefully divide this um, if you're going to get to the origin of the SMA. If you want to get further out, you don't have to mobilize that enough. You can identify the SMA. Usually uh, the venous system is more readily identified than the arterial, so you can identify that and trace it back to the arterial system. Uh, the pancreas and the transverse colon are really what's majorly in your way, even with mobilization. Um, so again, there's no clear exposure to the entire SMA. Either you go for the origin or you go out um, a few centimeters, but it's, uh, mobilizing the entire thing is, is pretty difficult. So the exposure I just talked about would give you something that looks like this. Now, of course, the duodenum isn't divided like that, and the transverse colon and the pancreas are going to be in your way. Um, but what you can get is a few centimeters out on the SMA, um, and a, again, you see there the left renal vein will kind of be a little bit in your way, but you take the branches, mobilize that inferiorly, and you get several centimeters of the SMA out, nice area for a bypass or if you're going to do your thrombectomy there. So about the IMA, the IMA is important because it supplies uh, blood to the sigmoid, to the left colon, um, has the left colic branch which is the first major branch usually of the IMA. So if you're going to sacrifice the IMA, it's usually well tolerated because of collaterals we're going to talk about. But if you do it, you have to do it right at the origin. If you sacrifice the IMA out distally past that left colic branch, you've sacrificed the collaterals and you're going to end up with some sigmoid ischemia. Um, and so this is kind of a simplified version of what the collateral circulation looks like. But in most cases, the celiac will uh, collateralize with the SMA through the gastroduodenum, arcabular they call it, and, they, and the, that branch or that pathway will take you to the superior mesenteric artery. So as long as this is intact, um, occlusions of the, either the celiac or the SMA are tolerated chronically. The SMA also collateralizes with the IMA. This goes from the middle colic of the SMA to the left colic of the IMA, as we discussed. This is where the marginal artery of Drummond, as we call it, occurs. Um, and these are pathway. It's not a single branch, but a pathway or an arcade of branches between the middle and left colic. Uh, so what's this patient have? Gives me a break for some coffee. So you see this on an angiogram. What, what do you suspect? A lot of whispering, confusion. So there, what do you see? What? Okay, the IMA is big. Not just the IMA, but it looks like a large collateral there. So the IMA is patent. There's large collateral, so 
SMA, right? There's probably some problems there with the SMA. Um, so there's probably an SMA stenosis. You can't visualize it well because we're looking at an AP shot. We're going to talk about that in a minute, how to image the different vessels. So an AP shot here shows you a nice IMA, large arcarelin, marginal artery drummond, so collateralizations are big, large, patent, usually in cases where you have an orificial stenosis of the SMA. So anytime you see this, even if you're doing something else, you want to quickly switch and get a lateral shot of the aorta. All right, so the IMA collateralizes with the hypogastric. So that's usually between the superior rectal artery of the IMA and the middle rectal artery, which comes off the hypogastric, right? So all these collaterals are variably important depending upon what's going on with the patient but they all um, collateralize with each other. Hypogastric collateralizes with the, what else? My residence. This shows up on test. So the major collateral pathways between the hypogastric and the IMA and also the hypogastric and the lower profunda. So the major actually collateralization to the lower extremity in common femoral occlusion is via the hypogastric to the profunda. All right, physiology. So visceral blood flow is famously variable, right? So it varies anywhere from about 10% of your cardiac output to almost 40%. So what changes it? A lot of things. So in, in periods of stress, when you need your blood mobilized for other things, your 10% of your cardiac output or less can be dedicated to your bowel, whereas after a big carb load, it can be up to almost 40%. So this changes uh, minute to minute, day to day, uh, and a variety of things kind of uh, influence those factors. So if you have your duplex out and you're looking at the SMA, there'll be large uh, fluctuations in the resistance of the SMA depending upon your perennial state. The celiac is relatively more constant. Why is that? Maybe on the slide behind me. Just requires a little bit of reading. Good job, Ali Khan. Right, so low resistance in the hepatic circulation. So there's certain areas in your body that have constant low resistance, right? Your kidneys, your liver, your brain. So this is why the, um, the signals uh, to the vessels going there are usually constantly low resistance and the celiac is one of them because of the common hepatic. All right, so we can vasoconstrict our mesenteric vessels. How do we do that? The arterial or smooth muscle cells mediate this, but what tells them to do it? A lot of things. So in low volume states, bowel receptors, will signal the uh, release of angiotensin II and vasopressin. So these are the two powerful vasoconstrictors that'll stimulate the uh, uh, arterial smooth muscle cells to constrict. Um, hypoxia will signal vasodilation, uh, and that's mediated through nitric oxide, which is released from red blood cells. You know this, I got you, it's cool. All right. So there's also metabolic and myogenic feedback pathways uh, that contribute to all this, but the major players here are angiotensin II, vasopressin, and nitric oxide. All right, so how do we diagnose this? We're supposed to talk about diagnosis too. There's gonna to be a little bit of overlap. My friend Will's gonna talk about how to treat all this stuff, but how do you diagnose it? Somebody's in the ER, somebody's in your clinic. Um, we, this is famous for being underdiagnosed, right? We often misdiagnose this, leading to uh, catastrophic results. So acute mesenteric thrombosis uh, is usually caused by an embolus. It can be acute on chronic, but uh, commonly we see an embolus, uh, usually to the SMA, and that happens within hours. It can be days, but usually hours, uh, and it's more of a sudden onset. Whereas chronic, they'll be in your clinic, it'll be weeks to months, there'll be weight loss, uh, and they'll have other manifestations of atherosclerosis. And again, both of these are usually uh, or often misdiagnosed. Chronic disease, you see, again, you see weight loss, right, cachexia, more common in women than men. Uh, but you have to be careful because a lot of people sent to your clinic will have this diagnosis, but they won't actually have the disease. You know, asymptomatic stenosis of the mesenteric vessels, very, very common. And uh, about 18% of people over 65 will have angiographic evidence of mesenteric artery stenosis, but not mesenteric ischemia. Um, so to really have the chronic disease, if it's uh, occurred over years, like we said, it has to involve multiple vessels. Very uncommon to have a single vessel case of chronic mesenteric ischemia. And the rare exception is would always be in the SMA. So if you have a single vessel stenosis or occlusion that's going to cause a problem, it's almost always the SMA. Uh, the symptoms, again, 
fairly typical abdominal pain, weight loss, food fear. Uh, the physical exam is less specific. You often see cachexia, but our patients can be very creative in how they eat, so some people are able to eat around this. So cachexia is often associated, but is not, um, not a singular uh, part of the diagnosis. So you have to look more for this abdominal pain that's associated with food. Um, acute, usually it is acute, sudden, right? Um, they may not have any history. They may have AFib um, or they may not. You know, a lot of people with emboli have other uh, more occult sources. There's a, often a reflux um, stool evacuation that can happen. It's not pathognomonic, doesn't always happen, but a sudden stool evacuation is a sign of acute mesenteric ischemia. Often in our um, aortic cases, if all of a sudden the patient just evacuates you know, post-operatively, you know, post-op hour eight, that's a bad sign, right? Something, something is going on and it should prompt you to do a flex sig. Uh, any kind of stool evacuation, a post-op aorta, you know, within the first 24 hours is not normal. Um, and then we always say pain out of proportion to physical findings. So you will see them writhing in the bed, but they oftentimes don't have an acute abdomen. If they do have an acute abdomen, what's going on? What's that? Right, so that, that means that usually that the bowel's infarcted, uh, and that warrants a quick trip to the OR for bowel resection. Um, thrombosis is usually in the setting of pre-existing atherosclerosis, right? And atherosclerosis in the visceral vessels tends to happen at the origin. So when we see thrombosis of the vessels, it's usually more proximal, and it's usually worse. These are sicker patients with uh, higher mortality. So properly diagnosed, the mortality is much higher in chronic mesenteric ischemia than in acute. All right, so oftentimes here you'll see uh, an SMA embolism, which happens in the area of the middle colic, right? And so the, often the proximal jejunum will be spared. So this is a... Uh, an operative case. Um, so how do we diagnose it? So we talked about history. Physical findings are variable and not very predictive. Uh, we look for the cachexia in the chronic cases, but the physical findings are not going to be very specific until full-on bowel infarction happens. So we use duplex in the office. This is for the chronic cases. Um, you want the patients to be fasting. Any bowel error is very uh, inhibitive in looking at these things. And so these are the numbers you have to know. Uh, to de detect the stenosis greater than 70%, we look for a peak systolic velocity greater than 275 in the SMA or 200 in the celiac. Why less in the celiac? Lower resistance, right? Lower resistance bed because it feeds the uh, hepatic circulation. So 275 and 200. Now to detect a stenosis greater than 50%, we look at the EDV, right? We want this greater than 45 in the SMA and greater than 55 in the celiac. And a, another um, finding in uh, mesenteric artery stenosis is reverse flow in the hepatic artery, right? Signs of collateral circulation activating. So reverse flow in the hepatic artery is also another finding of at least a 50% stenosis. So this is what it looks like. Um, the normal there, you see the uh, phasic nature of the signal. And then with the stenosis, you kind of lose that, becomes a monophasic signal um, with increased velocities. Uh, most of these cases are then uh, sent to CTA, right? CTA is really now the test of choice. It used to be angiography was the gold standard, but CTA has really become the standard. There is some uh, problem with artifacting from calcium, but usually you put it in the right window, you're going to be fine. Um, CTA has the advantage where you can look at the bowel as well. You can look at the venous phase, and it's relatively quick and easy to do. Uh, so here's some air, air in the bowel wall, air in the, uh, the biliary tree is abnormal and a sign of mesenteric ischemia. So what are the disadvantages of the CAT scan? The ones for at all, the dye, the cost, um, and there, it, there can be some problems with calcification. So in some cases we use MRA. Uh, MRA, I don't know if any of you have had an MRI, it's loud, it takes a long time. Um, so that's one of the big disadvantages, more claustrophobia. Uh, and MR is actually more subject to calcium artifact than CT. And um, the spatial resolution is not as good in most cases as a CTA. So it's clearly not first line diagnostic choice. 
Um, and then conventional angiography. This used to be the gold standard. We used to have to take the patient from the ER if we suspected mesenteric ischemia and get them up to the angio suite right away. Uh, but now we mainly do it to plan our interventions. Um, and it's especially useful in patients who've had prior visceral stents. It can be very hard to kind of properly visualize inside a stent with an MR or CT, and conventional angiography is often the, uh, the method of choice. So to visualize the origins, we gotta, again, we gotta get that lateral. So the lateral, you wanna put, put your flush catheter at least to level T12 or higher, and then get a nice lateral shot right at the diaphragm, uh, and you'll see the origins of the celiac and the SMA pretty well. Uh, if you want to go out to the more distal branches, usually we use the AP view. If you're going to come from the groin, which most people do for diagnostic, or a lot of people do, you have to use a reverse curve catheter, especially in the SMA. Uh, we find it easier to do, uh, especially our treatments, through a brachial approach, but, uh, but either is possible. All right, so finally in diagnosis, the lab studies, chronic disease, it'll be a low albumin. Um, lactic acidosis, thrombocytopenia, hyperkalemia, and late acute ischemia, uh, gastric tonometry. I don't know anybody use that. We, that's something people do to try in the kind of unclear cases of chronic mesenteric ischemia. It's used, but it's still fairly experimental. So again, acute case, your fastest, your best way to diagnose this would be a CTA. And chronic disease, your guy in your office, your lady in your office, you want to use a duplex. Um, two more rare syndromes that we're just going to touch on because uh, you may come across them is uh, celiac compression syndrome. This is compression of the celiac artery by the arcuate ligament. Varies with respiration. So what, what happens exactly? And the easiest way to think of this is think of the celiac artery like your arm. And so the celiac artery goes to the bowel. So where the bowel goes, the artery goes. So with inspiration, right, the lungs come down, the bowel comes down. With expiration, the bowel goes up. So with expiration, you see compression of the celiac axis at the arcuate ligament. Um, this has the disadvantage of being associated with a lot of psychiatric conditions. So it's very hard to get a proper diagnosis because again, about 30% of people, this will happen uh, normally too. Um, so it, it's quite common and it's rare to actually cause the uh, physical problems. Uh, and again, this is kind of what it looks like with celiac artery, varies with uh, inspiration, expiration, can be compressed by the arcuate ligament. SMA syndrome, also relatively rare, but it can be encountered. Uh, I, I just like that slide, I have no idea what that's showing, but ignore that one. So anyway, the SMA, right, crosses the duodenum, uh, and in most people, it crosses it at a, um, a relatively uh, normal angle, about 45, 30, 45 degrees. But especially in very thin people who've kind of lost that, um, that fat in the, in the retroperitoneum, the angle can be quite acute. And so when you see a very acute angle of the origin of the SMA, it can compress the duodenum there. And treatment of this would be, what's that? Yeah, usually treatment is not operative. Usually we try to get them, um, and again, there can be some psychiatric overtones to this as well. Anorexia can lead to this, and so it creates this cycle. So we try to get them to get gain weight, you know. Uh, you see it a little more common in women, so we usually try to get them to gain 15, 20 pounds. And then if they're still having symptoms or radiographic evidence of this process, then we usually refer them to our laparoscopic surgeons and they can uh, divert the bowel uh, around it. There's many different ways to do that, but the, the hallmark of the treatment is really conservative. And we usually with gaining that retroperitoneal fat back, they will increase the angle and relieve their symptoms.